StarU is a space for experimenting with individuation. On the podcast, we dive into everything from secondhand fashion to tarot to meditations, modalities, and mood ring colors they forgot to make. We welcome experiences and ignite conversations by inviting special guests to come share their take. Now onto the show with your host, the human behind StarU, Jackie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Star You podcast. My name is Jackie, and today we're kicking off our series of episodes dedicated to exploring individuation. We'll start today by discussing the definition according to Carl Jung, followed by um, my definition of the word and Molly, our guest's interpretation of the word. And speaking of Molly, today we are welcomed by Molly Dunn from Fulfilled Thrift. Hello, Molly. Hello, thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. It's been a great day and I'm super excited to chat on this topic. Same. So let me just tell everyone a little bit about who you are. So Molly here, my friend Molly, has spent nearly a decade educating consumers on the harmful effects of overconsumption, primarily in the fashion space. She brings a deep knowledge of trends, hallmarks of quality garment construction, and styling for every body type. Her experience working in fashion from directing marketing teams, overseeing photo shoots, modeling, and of course, picking vintage, makes Fulfilled Thrift the perfect way for her to serve her community. Perfect. And your shade of green, I must say, is absolutely perfect as well. What shade of green is this? This is the starry you shade of green. Oh my gosh, I'm so honored. It's even more starry you green than mine. I need to upgrade my greens here. So did you did you thrift that shirt? This sweater was actually my mom's and it didn't fit her anymore. So she handed it down to me. It's J. Jill 100% cotton. It's a good yeah. piece. That's amazing. I love it. Um, so before we get started here, let's just share what we're going to be focusing on. We're kind of asking and answering this question of can secondhand shopping actually help you along your process of individuation? Can it be a tool to bring you closer to your true self? Let's find out. So Molly, firstly, when we talk about connecting you with your community through fashion, what, where is your community based? Where are you based? I'm in Woodstock, Illinois. It's a little town about an hour outside of the city by train. It's longer than that, but we like to pretend that it's only an hour. <laughs> and isn't there something interesting about where you live? Something famous happened there? Yes, Groundhog Day, the movie was filmed here. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is such a random tidbit that I absolutely love. <laughs> That's yep, amazing. so we get some some tourism from that. There's like the bed and breakfast that was in the film. There's a Bill Murray mural and a groundhog statue and things like that. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I want to go there, actually. I would love to have you. I mean, I love it here. I think it's the best place in the world. Very Not because of the film. I mean, that's great, but like, I like <laughs> it for other reasons. Yeah, I'm sure it has more to offer than just that. Like Fulfilled Thrift. Yeah, yeah, yeah like a really cute little vintage store right in downtown Woodstock. That's so fun. Okay, so I think we should probably now get into the definition of individuation since it's something that a lot of people maybe don't know what it is. So the word existed before Carl Jung, but he had his own concept of what it meant in psychology and his Jungian psychology. So I'm just going to read a definition that's Jungian or Jungian. So... In Jungian psychology, individuation is the process in which the individual self develops out of an undifferentiated unconscious, seen as developmental psych psychic process during which innate elements of personality, the components of the psyche, and the experiences of the person's life become integrated over time into a well-functioning whole. And I will put a link to where that definition is from somewhere in the episode details, but it's from a, a person's website. Their name is Dr. Nathan Brandon. I actually don't know anything about him, but that definition really resonated with me as far as all the research that I've done on this topic of individuation. 
I'm not a Jungian psychologist and I don't know that much about Carl Jung. This is like the first introduction I have to him is, is information about this specific word. And from what I've seen so far, he himself didn't write a lot about that specific word. But anyway, the way that that I interpret that is that individuation is simply the process of becoming your authentic self. So for me, I think that is a lifelong journey. I, I, I'm not even just for me. I think for everyone, that is a lifelong journey. And I'm going to be 37 this year. And I think I'm the closest I ever have been to becoming my authentic self. And I've gone through a lot of things to get to that point. You know, a lot of life experiences, like reflection, going into therapy, meditation, tarot, digging into my astrology and human design, which are all things that Star U hopes to help people understand about themselves as well. So this word individuation, by the way, I have a whole long newsletter post about why individuation is a thing for Star U, so I can link to that as well. But I want to bring it to as many people as possible. And I think that in these modern times, individuation can be something as everyday as secondhand shopping. So that's why I have you on here, Molly, so we can dig into that. And before we do, I'd love to hear what your take on individuation is, because I think it's a word that could have many different meanings to many different people. The core is still the same, but I would love to hear what your your definition or your interpretation of it is. Yeah, when you started talking about individuation, kind of a few months ago it was like surprising to me because I was gifted the portable young for my birthday this year and I read a lot of Carl Jung this year so like from what I've read of him what I kind of interpret the individuation individuation <laughs> process to be is I think like if individuation is a hard word for people to wrap their head around I see it as integrating, like integrating all the parts of yourself into who you are. And primarily, I look at it as integrating your shadow self so that you're taking that part and bringing it into yourself so that it becomes a part of you and not something that you're suppressing that comes out in weird ways. So those parts of you that like exist, that you don't like, your flaws, acknowledging them, figuring out ways to work with them and even at times like honoring them, fulfilling them, doing the things that those sides of you need. Um, yeah, so you can be a whole being and and show up everywhere in your life fully you, so. And that's exactly what I know you and, you and I try to get out of fashion is representing our truest selves on the outside. And so Molly and I actually used to work together in fashion, I guess you would say. We, we used to work for a secondhand fashion startup, and that's how we met. And so we first kind of connected over consumerism and how fast fashion is terrible for the world. And yeah, I think we really connected over that. So I think this definitely comes full circle, this conversation. Molly, I really like your definition because it gets into the shadow sides of this individuation and this individuation concept and integrating them to become your whole true authentic self. I think with fashion, like there are things that maybe we are attracted to buying, but we decide not to do it because it's not trendy or we're afraid how it will look on us. Or, you know, we're afraid we'll be judged for what we're wearing. Do you see a correlation between the individuation process and secondhand fashion or fashion at all in terms of like integrating the parts of you that maybe you're not comfortable with? Yeah, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. I think I'm really drawn to like kind of kind of hippie boho style at times and I don't see that as something that's very trendy at all and I feel like a bit embarrassed that I'm into items like that but lately I've been trying to dress in that way more because if I can say something unique and different in fashion that's what I want I don't want to just dress like everybody else I want to see people doing their thing and that's what's inspiring And I've been making social content for a long time, and I think I've been trying to be what's trendy in my style so that I don't, like, stick out. 
but that's keeping me small. So I'm going to go for the boho stuff. And I think thrifting and shopping secondhand is a great way to do that because it's more sustainable if you're trying something out that's new to you, like you think you want to dress boho, but you're not sure. At least you're not buying something new from a fast fashion brand and like creating more demand for production of new goods. You're shopping circular. It's also more affordable. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned how you think that not buying what you want to buy because you're afraid of something is keeping you small. And I think that's such a great point because you want to be able to live big in your authenticity, right? Like you want to be you to the fullest. Um, I'm just thinking like fullest fulfilled thrift. Um, (laughs) So allowing yourself to just forget the fears and buy what you're attracted to and just try it out is part of individuating because you're trying to figure out who are, who even am I and how can I integrate these elements of myself Maybe it is through buying something boho when you normally wouldn't. Um, It's so funny because what I'm wearing right now I think is very trendy. Possibly it's overdone and out of trend at this point. Like the overlocking shirt and also I'm doing this ribbon in my hair thing, which everyone has been doing. But it makes me feel very authentic to me for some reason. I love the colors. I love... We're going to get into this later about what how Depop describes my style, but before we get into that, but my shirt is secondhand. I got it at Crossroads here in LA, which does, to me, I do think they seem to accept more fast fashion than, you know, a vintage store would, obviously. But it's interesting because when they buy your clothes, they claim that they try to stay away from fast fashion. And I'm like, half this place is Urban Outfitters. Even this is Urban Outfitters, I, re- I realized this morning. So it's funny talking about trends and individuation. Like at what point are you wearing something because you want to fit in? And at what point is it the fact that a trend brought something to your attention that you didn't know existed and you really like it? So I think it's it's just an interesting – it's just interesting because I really do love this shirt. And it is – I mean, you look so Jackie to me. (laughs) Like the style for you is just – it's adorable on you. You wear it well. Thank you, Molly. And – I think it's okay to like trends and want to wear them. I definitely still, I kind of, I do grapple with that. Like, am I interested in this just because it's a trend? But also Mm. I like this, like how red, like cherry red is becoming really popular. Like, heck yeah. Like red is such a powerful color. Like, of course I want to play with that trend. I have this little like panda pin on my jacket and I feel like, a little bit of an old lady, but I love it. And it makes me happy to look at it. So who cares, you know? Yeah, it's so cute. Speaking of red, I've been told (laughs) I think my astrology says that my color is red, and I have nothing red. I never wear red. I don't feel particularly attracted to the color red. And now that it is becoming a trend, I know it will be very accessible to me to find things I like that are in red. And so I feel like I'm going to be a very inauthentic person if I start wearing red in the next year because it'll just be because it was trendy and I was able to find it. And I'm sitting here saying I hate red. So that will be an interesting little experiment. For those who don't know, I'm a 3-5 profile in human design and experiments are like everything in my life is an experiment. So that'll be another experiment. Um, Yeah. So I don't know. Will I wear red? I also swore off scrunchies, which I've definitely worn since I swore them off. And I also swore off pleated (laughs) pleated denim skirts, which came back, but I didn't hop back on that. I stuck to my guns and I was like, these are not for me, but people really rocked them really well. Just, I, I just couldn't do it. But yeah, I digress. So you said a lot of amazing things, Molly, that I, and I know we could talk about this forever. But maybe we can get into a little bit our personal experiences with secondhand fashion because I know we kind of met in that sphere and you now are a secondhand business owner. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience, like maybe shifting from shopping fast to shopping slow or whatever your journey was? Yeah, I mean, I... 
never wore the same outfit twice in high school and I like was very proud of that. I was also voted best dressed in high school. So Molly, it was just always yes. what I loved. <laughs> we need photos. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I remember people would make fun of me for wearing high-waisted stuff. And I was like, this is it. This is going to be it. And then it was, you know? So, wow. yeah. But then I kind of like loosely studied fashion in college. I was too... I don't know, nervous about future career prospects to like full on do it. But I took fashion courses and majored in others, studied other things. But I had a fashion professor. She educated us about the harmful effects of fast fashion and just fashion in general and how much is produced and how much is discarded. And that really like changed my life learning that from her. And this was in like 2011. So not a ton of people were talking about that back then. So I'm very grateful to Susan Becker at University of Illinois. You formed my life trajectory. And she also had amazing style. She dressed like an all black with like really cute, like they were definitely like comfortable, like black boots, but like all she had like different ones. And yeah, anyway, (laughs) thank you, Susan Becker. (laughs) Hey Susan, if you have an Instagram, Uh, send it to us. Yeah, yeah. Where was I going? Oh yeah, fashion, shopping secondhand my whole life. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Then I I graduated, moved out to Colorado. One of my friends, his name is Pinner. He liked shopping secondhand, so I would go thrifting with him. And he actually started a vintage store of his own, and. I didn't, like, intend to do the same thing as him. It just kind of, like, happened that way. Well, you did a lot of stuff before that. That led you Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I worked for sustainable um, small businesses making sustainable products in the apparel space. And then the fashion app that Jackie already mentioned, as well as making content online about sustainability, shopping secondhand. And I started doing that because I, I I consumed a lot of fashion content online and I didn't really see any people talking about shopping secondhand or like the harmful effects of shopping so quickly and consuming so much. And so I wanted to like contribute to what was happening, but now everyone's talking about it. So it's kind of, it's kind of old news, which is good in a way, because I think people are becoming more aware and more more brands are trying to crop up and do things more sustainably. So yeah. Yeah. I opened my store after I got laid off from my last fashion gig and yeah. <laughs> That's amazing, Molly. What an interesting journey. And yeah, I I think I would love to hear more about the day to day of what your business life entails and how you I think you called it picking. Do you call it picking vintage? Picking? I don't know. The way you – is that what you Yeah. Said? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. like, what does that entail and how do you select? Even, even like, if your store has its own identity in a way, um, how are you picking the clothes to match that identity? And then how are you helping customers find their identity or become closer to their authentic selves or go along their individuation process by offering something that they want or that they wouldn't normally try – do you want to talk about that right now or should I share my journey? You should talk yeah, about it. I think I can I think I can tie this into individuation too with what we were talking about thrifting as a way to try on different parts of yourself that you might want to integrate. If you as long as you buy quality pieces, they're gonna retain their value. And if you introduce those pieces into your life, try on that boho version of yourself that scene girl version of yourself, whatever it is. And if it doesn't work out, if you if you got quality pieces for yourself, so made out of natural fibers, looking for good garment construction, which I'm not going to go into right now, but just like inspecting things for the quality, those things will retain their value. And even if they don't work out for you, you'll be able to resell them, give them to a friend, or even donate them back to the thrift store. If you if you can see someone buying the item, it's okay to donate it. But if it's damaged or you couldn't see someone else buying it, you generally 
don't want to donate it because it just creates waste. So deal with it on your own. You can bring it to a textile recycler or make it into rags for yourself to use at home or something. But yeah, so when I'm sourcing for my store or picking vintage, as it's called by some, I am looking for those those hallmarks of quality. I'm I'm always looking for things with natural fibers. Sometimes I do find like cotton blends because if if it's like mostly cotton, it's at least going to be pretty breathable, nice to wear. Synthetics typically are like polyester and acrylic. Those they aren't really like they don't match your body heat. So if you're or they do they do match your body heat, but in like a bad way. So if you're hot, it's gonna make you even hotter. If you're cold, it's gonna make you even colder. Wow. And if you're listening to this right now, you might think about some tops you have in your closet that are like that you're like, I don't really ever want to wear that because it's not comfortable. It makes me like get pity. And it's probably because it's a, a synthetic. Wow. But there's there's a lot of a lot of workout gear is made out of synthetics and it is like made to be sweat wick- wicking. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just I don't think it's necessarily it's just not what I'm looking at for my store. Sometimes if it's a really special piece and it is like polyester, but it's like I could see someone loving it and I love it. So I I have kind of a checklist of what I'm looking for and you know if it's if it hits 4 out of 5 things then it gets to come into the store. Nice, that's amazing. And very helpful information for people who may not know. I didn't really know most of that. In fact, what I'm wearing is probably does not hit your checklist even though it is second hand. It is still fast fast fashion, so I'm sure it's made of plastic. But so have you had any, I'm just curious, have you had any interactions with customers where you feel like, so, so basically I worked, I worked in the mall when I was in college, I worked at Delia's and one of the thrills that I had of working there was like making someone's day with an outfit. So they would come in, they would be like 16 years old going on their first date wanted to get the perfect boot cut jeans and the perfect graphic tee and we would layer it with a cardigan and they would leave feeling like you could just tell they were so excited. They loved their outfit. They loved how they looked in it. And it was just like such a great feeling. It was so fulfilling and so fun. And I don't know, it just like built a relationship, but it also made you feel like you helped them on some journey personally. So have you had any experiences like that with any of your customers? I did have a woman buy a dress for me and come back in and said, I met a man when I was wearing that dress oh and it was God. like a magic dress. And <laughs> But my favorite part is just seeing people try on items that I'm obsessed with and mm-hmm. I love and like seeing it on them and it looking even better than I could have imagined. Like that's always such a treat. And I've been doing more photo shoots for my store with some friends and getting to collaborate and see how they look at my pieces differently than I look at them and the potential that they see. It's just so cool to have like a physical thing in the world and see how other people interact with it. Totally. I Okay, this concept of the magic dress, like that needs to be a children's book or something, the magic dress. I just love that. Yeah. I love that. But actually, you reminded me. So when you said that this outfit looks so jacky to you. It's just so interesting because I agree and you know me very well and people who don't know me, maybe they they wouldn't think that. But it's this other element of individuation is like, do you see me for the me that I see me because I project the real me so hard? You know, like I have a very hard time being inauthentic and I just say what's on my mind and I do what I'm going to do. And of course, I'm only human. There are I wrote about this in a, in a blog post. Like there are moments when I'm not authentic because I'm in a group and I want to people please or whatever. But when it comes to my my um, outward reflection of what's on the inside, it there's nothing better than someone being like, you look so you, if that person knows you. So I just, I thought that was a really fun thing for you to say to me and it really made my day. <laughs> Oh, yay. (laughs) So thank you. And so yeah, I guess I'll just touch a little bit on my experience with secondhand fashion. As I said, I worked in the mall in college. And that was in 2000. I graduated college in 2009. And then I didn't really work in fashion again until I worked at a magazine. 
And that was around 2013, 2015. And I felt like nobody was really talking about secondhand then. Also working in a magazine at that time, it was like, you know, you have advertisers, you have fast fashion companies knocking at your door wanting to be featured all the time. So it was a lot of covering fast fashion. But it was in New York. And you could see just the style in New York. I mean, everyone's mixing vintage with fast fashion or making their own clothes. And then I was in music for a while. And didn't get back into working in fashion until I worked with you, Molly. So in the interim, I was strictly wearing fast fashion. I don't think I ever bought anything vintage in my life until my early 30s, late 20s, which is crazy to think about now. And growing up, I went to Catholic school and I wore a uniform. So I didn't have to have a lot of clothes. And it wasn't until around, you know, 2020, when there was a lot of things that people learned about the world for the first time, unfortunately, it took so long. And I learned a lot about the environment and secondhand fashion, and I became vegan. And that is the year I also started my human design journey. So this concept of human design deconditioning, if anyone's familiar with that, I started all of this around the same time. And I'm proud to say that I've shopped only secondhand now since February 17th, 2021. So it took me a year to make the transition. Also, 2020 was a weird year. year. Is that the year I'm really going to start trying to thrift? No. So 2021 is when it happened. (laughs) And I'm just so proud of it. It's like so tied to my identity. And shopping secondhand is such a challenge sometimes because you have your own personal checklist, right? You have to find things that you are attracted to. They have to fit you. They have to be in your budget. And if they don't fit, you can get them tailored, which is a new concept to me as well, you know, within the last few years. And so, yeah, I just feel like when you are shopping fast and buying things that are mass produced, it is very hard to individuate because you can go to a concert or a brunch or wherever, a party, a wedding and be wearing the same exact thing as someone else. Whereas if you're shopping secondhand, which maybe we should really explain the difference between secondhand and vintage, because a million people have this. This is from Urban Outfitters. So I don't know how much individuating I'm doing wearing this. Internally, I feel it because it matches my authentic personality. But when it comes to vintage, the chance that you're going to have the same vintage item as someone else is pretty low, right? So do we want to talk about that for a sec? Yeah, sure. So typically vintage is anything over 20 years old from where wherever you are in time. <laughs> so right now it's before 2004 is considered vintage, which is crazy. I go to antique malls and I see toys that I had as a kid. Oh my god. And that is just wild. Oh, but- <laughs> I feel old, but anyway. Yeah, so that is the that's the categorization to get included in most like vintage markets if you're trying to sell. That's the kind of line that they set. Like true vintage is pre 80s typically, I think. Honestly, I'm really into 80s, 90s Y2K, so I'm not like totally sure like what that would be considered, but that's what I'm guessing it is like 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s. You know, I can just keep saying numbers, but yeah, <laughs> would be would be true vintage. But '90s style and Y2K style has had such a resurgence in popularity, which I love. Mm-hmm. Jackie obviously loves. Mm-hmm. So those items are so con- they're considered vintage. I mean, even even though they're like more recent, they've been within our lifetime. They're they're just typically better better quality because fast fashion really started with the gap in the 80s women started entering the workforce more people realized that they could market to them and sell to them more a lot of the like top luxury brands got taken over and manufacturing was shipped over to China and the quality of production went down so that they could make more and sell more like small goods like tiny wallets and sunglasses and Anything that you can slap a designer name on that's affordable and a person can feel like they have part of that brand, I see that as kind of the start of it. And then I I have read that Gap was really the first fast fashion brand because they were selling kind of well-made, affordable basics 
and just like opening stores because it was working and they had these gorgeous ads and they were selling a lifestyle that was attainable and everybody wanted. That is so funny the way you put it that they were selling a lifestyle that was attainable that everyone wanted because in a way I feel some companies are selling a lifestyle that everyone wants but that is secondhand like Depop for example. I don't I don't actually think Depop has very many ads but I've seen other secondhand companies having ads like The Real Real and mm-hmm. I'm not sure who maybe even Poshmark I've seen have ads but we have to talk about Depop. I mean they are I feel like they do represent some sort of lifestyle and they have a very my dog's joining now. Hello, dog. Oh, hello. Sorry, everyone. (laughs) Okay, hello. So speaking of Depop, I think we have to address this end of the year campaign that they had, kind of like Spotify's wrapped with your top songs of the year. Depop had this end of the year, you know, like what is your style story thing. And they used keywords. I'm not sure how they curated these keywords if it was like AI or an algorithm tied to what you bought over the year or what it would be really interesting to learn also Spotify when they first launched Spotify wrapped I feel like there was a lot of information on how they did it and why they did it so maybe Depop does have this and we just have to look it up but my point is is that Depop used three specific keywords to describe my style over the last year and I was obsessed with what they said And they said that my style was a mix of Barbie, Y2K, and Normcore. And I loved it. I was like, look at me right now. I have the pink ribbon. I have these normal ass glasses. Sorry. I have these normal glasses. Um, (laughs) And what was the Y2K? I do think overlocking is Y2K, but maybe I'm wrong. Choker, a pearl choker. Anyway. So Molly, you saw your end of the year keywords as well. What were yours? I also had normcore. Another word they used to describe my style was coastal and then Y2K. Wow. I do feel like that's very you. I think so too. Yeah. One of my best friends, she would always tell me that I belonged in LA with my style. So that's the coastal element, perhaps the boho element. Come visit me. I know. Visit me in LA. I want to. Yeah. Yeah, you have to. So like for me, I just wonder where did they get these words from and how because we have an overlapping word and it's not to say that our style is complete. We have two. Oh, we have two, two yeah. overlapping. Y2K Warm and Warmcore and Y2K. Mm-hmm. So we we have a similar style, but nothing too exact. Like I wouldn't even put us in the same exact category style wise maybe we both are just individuating so hard that we have our own unique style (laughs) even though we have a similar style so it's just kind of it begs the question how many of these words did they have to choose from what was this process like because molly you and i have both worked in like content creation and marketing and somewhat fashion for me mostly a lot of fashion for you we know how these things can work right you before ai at least someone would have a list of keywords or create a list of keywords And they would be tied to the person's purchases in some way with tags or whatever on the back end. And then three of them, perhaps the most, how would I describe this? The three, the three styles you bought the most of maybe are what informed these tags. So how many tags did they have? If they had 10 tags versus a thousand tags, that could create very different results. And I feel like if the tags were more in the thousand range, you and I wouldn't even overlap perhaps. So the number must be much less. And it's just like, how does Depop see us? Does Depop see us as there are only 10 types of style? There's Barbie, Normcore, Y2K, and seven others. And then what does that mean for the collective conscious of fashion? You know, like we all love Y2K, it seems. So how can we individuate even though there's this overarching theme or inspiration around us all the time? I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Because we, it's just like that Devil Wears Prada quote about the blue, the blue circulating down from the designers to the, you know, where was I going with that? 
Just if there's only like 10 different styles that we can fit in and that these apps see us as, where how how to individuate? <laughs> Is it possible? Yes, exactly. Because I'm just going to use the most recent purchase I made as an example. I bought these bright, like neon highlighter, bright orange, see-through rain boots that were Forever 21. See, I'm such a bad secondhand shopping representative because I still get fast fashion. I just get it secondhand. I really have to work on that. Note to self. Anyway. No, I don't. That's not bad. I do that too. Just because an item is fast fashion doesn't always mean it's bad quality. They've done studies about whether the kind of common trope that a fast fashion item degrades faster in the wash. It's not true. There's like no correlation between that. The only thing is that the it's produced way faster, which is unsustainable. We also tend to take care of our pieces that are more expensive or from nicer brands better. So like that can contribute to the longevity. Mm -hmm. If you have like a Gucci sweater versus a Forever 21 sweater, even if they would like, if you took care of them both the exact same way, they might last the same time. You're going to take care of the thing that you like value more. Mm. That's a big part of it. I I have fast fashion things in my store right now. I buy fast fashion things secondhand. It's if it's like I said, if it's a if it's a quality staple piece or even not staple piece, if it's well made. I I had H and M tops from high school that I had for like years and years and years that lasted a long time. It's not necessarily the quality of production, but sometimes it is. Thank you for sharing that, Molly. That's great information. I swear, nothing sec- nothing fast fashion that I've ever owned has ever ripped or gotten a hole or anything. It's 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 crazy. But these orange boots, sometimes when I shop secondhand, I will Google the item just to see how it was styled and just to see what the price was and for all different reasons. Maybe even how to wash it if it's missing a tag or what is the brand if it doesn't have a tag. With these orange boots, I know for a fact they're Forever 21. I tried to look them up and I couldn't find them on the internet. And I felt like although they were obviously a mass-produced item from Forever 21, I kind of felt like I was the only person that had them, even though it's not true. So for some reason, they really spoke to me. I was looking for rain boots for the one or two days a year it rains in LA. When it rains, I need these boots. So I got them and they came in the mail and I love them. They're so cool. They're so amazing. And yes, perhaps millions of other people have them. Will I ever see these people? I don't know. But the boots make me feel right. Like, I want them. I need them. That's true to how I feel inside. So is it possible to buy things that everyone has and still be individuating? I I guess it is. If it's true to you. If it's true to you. Yeah, I definitely think – I definitely think so. There are trends – that exist right now that make me feel very me like kind of the oversized tomboyish boyish look there are times when I wear that and I feel like the most myself and I'm like dressing like head to toe like just freaking trendy (laughs) trendy girl (laughs) but I feel like totally myself and maybe the trends are are helping me feel that way that I don't know That is where, that is a good question, Molly, because it's like, is it what we think makes us feel like who we are or is it really who we are? It's such a hard question to answer. And individuation is all about figuring out who you really are without the influence of society and other people. And how do you know? How do you know? It's so hard. I mean, human design is a big part of Star You, and there's a lot of tools within human design to kind of tap into your authenticity. Same with astrology and all these other mediums that I'm obsessed with and that will be integrated into Star You. But I can't help but think of this, my own personal magic dress that I've told you about before. Maybe you don't remember, but I need to, maybe, maybe we could end on a personal connection we each have with a secondhand item and, and how it made us feel at our most authentic because I have that story ready right now. <laughs> okay. I want to hear it. Maybe you remember this. I was going to a wedding at the Madonna Inn in 2000, either 18 or 19. And I went to the Rose Bowl Flea 
in Pasadena. And there's there's a booth there that had the most amazing vintage clothes. There's a lot of vintage clothes there, but there's one that I feel is all handmade vintage or mostly handmade because there's never any tags on it. And you can just tell by like the construction that it was probably custom made for someone. So I saw this dress that I felt was absolutely wild and I didn't know if it was appropriate for a wedding, but it was it was sort of a prairie-ish style and it had like lace, it had like a bib and lace and white dress with florals. It was like pink florals. There was a bright orange, same color as my PVC Forever 21 boots, bow made of like some sort of velvet. It was amazing. It was amazing. I died when I saw this dress. I was like, I need this for this wedding to Madonna in. I have no idea if I'll ever wear it again, but I need this dress. And I actually did get it tailored and I got a giant slit put in the front. And it was my obsession. And it was like the best thing ever. And after this person's wedding, I had the dress for a while and it kind of sat in my closet. I didn't really wear it again. I didn't really see an an event that was appropriate to wear it. I was like, this is, I'm not going to wear this to the grocery store. I'm not going to, you know, it's just one of those things where I felt like it was for that one event. Oh gosh. See, now I'm really thinking hard. Okay, let me just finish the story and then I'll and then I'll say what Okay. I'm so, eventually I was like I'm never going to wear this again and I donated it. I donated it to Goodwill, which was so silly. So silly. Why did I do that? I could have sold it to a vintage store. There's an amazing vintage store in LA that I love going to, Squaresville, and they buy really good vintage. They only buy good vintage. They would have bought this they would have bought this dress. I'm telling you right now. So why didn't I do that? I don't know. I was probably brainwashed by goodwill to just drop it off. So I did. And I regretted it like a week later. I was like, why did I do that? I need this dress again. And I actually went back to goodwill to to shop and look for it. And it wasn't there. I'm like, where did that go? Where did it go? Where was, where was it sent to? And to this day, I will go to any secondhand thrift shop, vintage store, go to the dress section and I just look at the bottom of the dress section and look for the fabric and for the slit and I haven't found it and I'm just like that dress the way I felt in that dress the way I felt when I saw it the way I felt buying it it was just so authentic to me and it was clearly made for someone like it was custom made you could tell what a thing to get rid of. What a thing to just let go for no good reason. And we've talked about this before too, which is what I started thinking about while I was telling the story, is like wearing things for one-time use. So weddings are a great example. If you go to a wedding, it, back in the day, I think you told the story, Molly, did you, that your mom had one dress she wore to all the weddings? Was that you or no? I don't remember telling that story. Someone sure I know me. in life told me that their mom had one dress that they wore to all the weddings and nobody questioned it. Nobody was like, ew, you wore that dress to, uh, to, to the other friend's wedding. That's just the dress they wore to weddings. It was their wedding dress. It's like with a funeral dress or something. And now weddings are such a crazy fashion phenomenon where you do just, a lot of people just buy an outfit for, for one wedding and then they get rid of it. And I did the same thing, even though the item was secondhand, even though I liked the item, even though I got it tailored to my body, I still wore it once and thought I would never wear it again and got rid of it. So I guess, how can I end this sad story on a good note? Because it really is a bummer. I think the beauty is in the fact that I I felt truly myself when I found it and bought it and wore it. And perhaps I let it go at the pressure of society instead of keeping it. I thought, clean, clean out your closet. You don't have enough space. Only keep the things that you like. You'll never wear it again. Get rid of it. And with individuation, I think it's all about how you feel inside. So I can't say I felt good giving it away. It just felt like something I was supposed to do. So I think with individuation and coming to your into your true authenticity, it has to be about what you truly think. And sometimes getting to that is really hard because you have friends, you have parents, you have partners, you have society, you have commercials, you have so many things talking to you. So that is why I want Starry You to exist to help people get to that point. 
within themselves. That was a lot. Okay, Molly. Yeah. I want to hear your no. personal connection to an item. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm still thinking about this little panda pin because I ordered this like bulk lot of vintage jewelry from a Depop seller, actually. Not sponsored by Depop, no. this podcast. <laughs> but if you're listening. <laughs> um. <laughs> You and know. I didn't I didn't know that this little guy was going to be in there. And he was. And when I opened the package, I was like, oh, my gosh. And I love pandas. And it's like a big part of like my iconography, I like to say, like the things that I'll always draw or like elements that I like always incorporate in my art and design. And yeah, I just love pandas. And so now he's on my jacket and I added it to this jacket, which is this is a, not a vintage or anything jacket but now I want to wear this jacket all the time because the panda's on it and I can like show myself like I have that part of my personality with this little panda brooch with rhinestone eyes I pandas. think <laughs> <laughs> we love pandas I think it's so just relevant that you're talking about a pin which could be removed and put on anything that you're wearing and bring that element of authenticity with you wherever you go and it's also like a reminder for yourself of your own authenticity even if someone even if no one comments on her is like such a cute panda like that part of you is always with you it's like it's like your inner child or something like that part of you that no one can touch that is yours is always there with you so Wow. The pin one was a great example. I should have picked something else because mine was just depressing. Well, do you want to do something different and we can splice no. that in instead of the other story? Okay. No, because this okay. is this is the reality is that individuating is sometimes hard. Like you – it's hard work and it's lifelong. And there are a lot of pressures to to not be who you really are. So – I felt pressured to get rid of that dress for some reason. Yeah. And that's just the truth. Yeah. It's it's all learning and growing and being like, okay, well, I'm not going to beat myself up about that time, but I'll know for next time not to do that. Like, I just yeah. – I think that all the time, like, every day, like, yeah. Totally. I was actually just talking to a friend today about astrology and how, like, sometimes astrology will be like, oh, if you're feeling moody today, it's because of this, or like, be careful of your moods today, you might lash out on someone. And sometimes those things are really relevant. And sometimes I'm like, I don't feel moody at all. I don't feel like I'm going to lash out on anyone. And it's either because it's just, it's wrong. Or it's like, I'm actually aware of my moods, and I'm conscious of them. And I'm able to like, sit with my feelings and have some more emotional maturity than I've had in the past. And it's just funny when those things become no longer relevant because you've done work on yourself. So I think like the shadow sides, truly integrating your shadow sides, as you were saying with individuation, it's like you're aware of those things now and you can work with them. You can own them. They're a part of you. You're not pushing them away. You're not afraid of them. Um, yeah, I just feel like Secondhand fashion ties in so well with individuation as proven by this conversation. Yeah, it really truly does. It lets you play with something that's outside of what everyone else is doing and what is popular and what you can find in the stores. Amazing, Molly. Well, that was so fun. And I feel like we could talk forever. I know. I know. <laughs> Is there anything else that we really need to share or do you feel do you feel we've said everything we need to say right now? I need to see those boots and that dress. I feel like you should post them on your Instagram stories or something with this podcast so people can see. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Amazing, Molly. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. That was amazing. You're the best ever. I really appreciate you. And maybe we can tell people where they can learn more about Fulfilled Thrift. Yeah. So my website is fulfilledthrift.com. You can shop on there and learn more about my mission as well as on Instagram and TikTok at Fulfilled Thrift. And go visit Molly when you're on your tour of the Groundhog's Day filming locations. 
Yep, Woodstock, Illinois. I'm on the second story of the Woodstock Square Mall above the sewing studio. <laughs> so cute. Obsessed. And if you want to learn more about Starry U, you can head to starryu.app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Molly, for being here. And I like to end things by saying, may the stars be with you, but I'm still playing, playing with it. So let's just end with that for now. Everyone, may the stars be with you. Yeah. And go check out Star You because it's really amazing, incredible. It's helped me on my personal path and journey and primarily being appreciative of my life and my gifts and what I have. Wow, Molly, that's so beautiful. Thank you. We're just both so authentic. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Nice. Oh, look. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us on our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com slash staru app. If you want to start experimenting with your individuation process and unlock your birth chart insights, join staru for free by visiting staru.app. That's two R's, two U's, and two P's everywhere. By the way, if today's date is the date of your birth, happy birthday. If your birth date is in 88 days from now, happy design day.